Chapter 4 The Blue Stain While Penny ran for a cloth to wipe up the spot on the linoleum, Laura plunged the shirt into a pan of cold water under the spigot of the sink. Only part of the stain was coming out. She wailed, What shall I do? Let it soak for a while, Louise suggested. Perhaps Mr. Mrs. Comstock has some stain remover fluid in the house, Penny added. She searched through the cupboards and the shelves by the cellar way, but could find nothing which would serve the purpose. Anxiously, the girls inspected the shirt. Well, it's not coming out, Laura said. I may as well start packing my things. Mrs. Comstock might not say anything about it, Louise ventured. She'll say plenty, Laura replied grimly. Oh, why must I be so awkward? It seems luck is just against me. I have an idea, Penny cried unexpectedly. Remember that Chinese laundry next door, Lou? Well, we'll take the shirt over there and see if the laundry man can remove the stain. He'll never make it back in time, Laura protested. Maybe we will, Penny insisted. Anyway, there's nothing to lose in trying. You keep on with this stupid ironing, Laura, while Louise and I see what they can do. If Mrs. Comstock returns ahead of us, we'll try to smuggle the shirt into the basket without her seeing it. Wrapping the stained garment in an old newspaper, the girls made their way to the laundry next door. It was a fairly new two-story building which stood so close to the mansion that at one point the walls actually seemed to touch. At the rear, a porch very similar to the one built on the ancient house, extended close to the river, and at high water time, water easily could swish against the high supporting post. Penny and Louise entered the laundry and waited for the proprietor to come back to the room. Seeing Lee was a squatty little man with a yellow, mask-like face whose slippers made no sound as he padded towards them. Missy Wish washing to be done? he asked politely. Yes, we have some rather special items here, Penny said, unwrapping the shirt. Bluing was spilt on this garment. Can you remove the stain? The Chinese man peered at the shirt for a moment. Very bad stain, he remarked, but Sing Li will make it come out. Missy, come back tomorrow, maybe? Tomorrow, Penny exclaimed. Oh, this is a rush order. We'll have to have it right away, say in 15 minutes. The Chinese man shook his head and thrust the shirt back into her hand. You wouldn't need to iron it, she urged. Just remove the stain for us. That shouldn't take very long. The laundry man hesitated. Sing Li, get the blue spot out from the shirt if you pay a dollar. Penny was taken aback at the exorbitant demand, but she reluctantly agreed to the terms. Sing Lee vanished into the rear room and the girl sat down on the bench to wait. Ugly little fellow, isn't he? Louise whispered. I hope he does a good job on that shirt. Penny had been surveying the room, staring with interest at an object which hung on the wall directly above the bench. Did you notice what you're sitting under, Lou? she inquired. Louise glanced up and with a little cry of alarm sprang to her feet. A heavy silver sword with an intricately molded handle and a wicked looking blade had been suspended over her head. Oh, it won't bite you, Penny laughed. It might if it decapitated me if it would fall, Louise retorted. You don't catch me sitting under such a thing like that. She arose and remained standing until Sing Lee returned with a shirt. Inspecting it to make certain the stain had been removed, Penny gave the proprietor the sum he had demanded. You don't live in White Falls, he inquired, pocketing the dollar bill. We're from Riverview, Penny explained. Just at the moment, we're staying next door. Maybe you stay at the old mansion tonight, Sing Lee asked softly. No, we're merely here with a friend, Penny answered shortly. She had not cared to reply to so many personal questions. The girls carried the shirt back to the house next door, taking care to enter the kitchen quietly. There was no sign of Mrs. Comstock, or for that matter of Laura.
The ironing had been stacked neatly on the kitchen table. I suppose she's working upstairs, Louise said. I'll finish this shirt before Mrs. Comstock drops in on us. She neatly pressed the garment and folded it, laid it with the other shirts. There, she declared in satisfaction, Mrs. Comstock will have keen eyesight if she discovers anything's wrong. Scarcely were the words spoken when the girls were startled to hear a piercing scream from one of the upstairs rooms. That was Laura's voice, Penny exclaimed. They darted up the circular staircase two at a time, wondering what latest misfortune had come upon their friend. Laura's room was empty. However, as Penny and Louise were looking about in bewilderment, the door of room number seven opened, and the girl came out into the hall. Her face was white, the pupils of her eyes dilated with fear. Why, what's the matter, Laura asked Penny. That room, Laura whispered, those paintings. Louise and Penny opened the door and glanced inside the room. It was a large chamber with a massive four-poster walnut bed, dresser, the usual chair. Heavy red draperies hung at the window, one of which overlooked the river directly beneath. On the east wall were four portraits done in oil and hung in massive gilt frames. The figures were very nearly life-size, the faces depressing. It is pretty awful, Penny said, but what made you scream, Laura? That painting on the wall, Laura whispered in awe. The portrait of a man with the red velvet hat? I was dusting... She broke off suddenly as the girls heard a door slam downstairs. Mrs. Comstock, Laura finished excitedly. She mustn't find us here. Quickly, the girls fled from the room, closing the door after them. Laura busied herself dusting the stairwell just as Mrs. Comstock appeared. Huh, the woman commented. I must say you've done better than I expected. Never mind the rest of the dusting. Get downstairs to start dinner. Yes, Mrs. Comstock, Laura replied. Penny noticed that as the girl descended the stairway, her hands were shaking and she gripped the railing for support. I suppose we should be starting for home, Lou, Penny remarked. We have a long drive ahead of us. Laura halted and turned an appealing face towards her friends. Can't you wait just a little longer, she replied. Instantly divining that Laura needed their companionship and moral support, the girls generously agreed that they would remain for a time. The decision seemed displeasing to Mrs. Comstock, who obviously considered them as intruders in the house. However, she refrained from her comment. Gus and I shall expect dinner promptly at 6.30, she told Laura. You'll find the makings of a hash in the ice chest, and there are turnips to be cooked, and you might make a rice pudding for dessert. Taking the evening paper, she disappeared into the parlor, and the three girls were left alone. They retired to the kitchen, carefully closing the door. She didn't even notice the shirt, Laura exclaimed in relief. No, Penny agreed. Sing Lee next door did a good job for removing the stain. But Laura, I think you should decide to return with us to Riverview. I'd like to, said Laura, sinking down into a chair. She appeared to waver and then added determinedly, No, I'll not be so silly. I'll stick it out even after what happened up there in room number seven. What did happen, Penny asked quickly. What did you what did you start to tell us just as Miss Comstock appeared? Sounds rather ridiculous now, Laura whispered. Yet it's true, I swear it. Something about the painting, Penny urged. I was dusting the bed. Laura said in a low tone. All the time I felt so uncomfortable. I can't explain the sensation. Yes, Penny nodded. The room gave me the same feeling. Suddenly I glanced towards that painting. The man with the red velvet cap? Laura's voice dropped still lower, and she shivered. His eyes were looking straight at me. And was that when you screamed? No, replied Laura. I cried out in terror when I saw those terrible eyes move. Do, 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 do.